Welcome to our Virtually Speaking series. Today we are joined by Latimer parent, Dr. Xavier Bray, who is the director of the renowned Wallace Collection in London. Xavier is an art historian specializing in Spanish art and has been the, the director of the Wallace Collection since 2016. Um, he completed his PhD at Trinity College Dublin on Goya as a painter of religious imagery. He was previously chief curator at Dulwich Picture Gallery in London, um, the Museum of Fine Arts in Bilbao, as well as assistant curator at the National Gallery. He's created, curated a wide range of exhibitions, including El Greco, Velazquez, Goya, Ribera. Since joining the Wallace Collection, he's overseen and co-curated several exhibitions, including Richard Wallace, Henry Moore, and Forgotten Masters of Indian Painting from, for the East India Company. Before we hear from Xavier, I just wanted to very briefly tell you a little bit more about the Virtually Speaking series. We launched this program of online talks over the summer as a way to bring together the Latimer community in the absence of our usual social events. It's really taken off. Um, the series is such an impressive showcase of our community, including teachers, alumni, parents. Um, I see Robert Orm is here with us today, um, all giving talks of a really high cal caliber. Um, if you haven't already, I'd encourage you to look at the full Virtually Speaking collection on our website and all the back, um, the back lectures are listed there as well. Of course, as you know, these events are also fundraisers and I wanted to thank both our speakers without whom this series couldn't be possible and to you, our audience, for supporting the talks. Many of you have kindly made a donation when registering for the talk today, which raised more than 400 pounds, and we've raised collectively 10,000 pounds from this series since July. And this is a really staggering, wonderful amount, so thank you. Um, with your help, we hope to be able to raise enough money to, to fund five pupils for the bursaries appeal for next year. And finally, a couple of house rules. Um, everyone will be on mute so, you can, so we can all hear Xavier clearly. Um, do you feel free to type questions into the chat bar and Xavier will answer as many as there is time for um, at the end of his talk. So it just remains for me to welcome Xavier and over to you. Uh, thank you so much Ruby for the, the kind introduction and uh, thank you for all turning up. Um, I'm going to be talking about my wonderful inst institution here, the Wallace Collection. Uh, which some of you, I hope, will know. Um, let me just set up the um, PowerPoint. I hope you can all see it. There we go. Uh, can you all hear me? Are you, oh. you all still there? Yes. Okay. Um, so, um, as you can imagine, things are pretty difficult at this moment in time. Um, we've uh, just been told that uh, we've, we've moved into a, a new um, sort of set of rules and guidelines that we have to follow uh, both as a museum but also as Londoners. So um, things are, are happening here but uh, the Wallace Collection is open. Uh, we've been open since the 15th of July and it's been a, a rather uh, interesting time um, if not strange and I suppose what what has been a, a really good moment for me personally to, is to reflect on uh, the Wallace, uh, quite literally past, present and future. Um, and I think this is a, for me a great opportunity to share with you some of my concerns, my ideas, and also um, the, the sort of relevance and function that uh, the Wallace collection might have in, in today's world. We, um, um, the, the way it sort of all began really is during lockdown, uh, we, um, we knew that we had been planning for a celebration of, of, of 120 years since we actually had opened to the public for the first time on the 25th of June, um, uh, 1900. And uh, the uh, opening of the Warriors at that time was one of the great sort of celebrations, one of the, the moments when this great collection, the Wallace collection was having been private and having been in private hands, was quite literally suddenly made uh, public uh, and given to the nation. And hence uh, the, the sort of subtitle to my lecture, A Noble Gift to the Nation, uh, which was uh, is taken from the Evening Standard at the time. For some of you, just to remind you where the Wallace Collection is, um, it is 
in the taxi's knowledge as where does the Laughing Cavalier by Franz Hals live, Manchester Square Wallace Collection. Um, and it is, you know, at the heart of Marylebone, just behind Selfridges. It's in this very quiet square. Uh, people tend to use it for uh, parking their cars when they go to the Wigmore Hall in the evenings. Uh, but it's, it tends to be quiet. And for those who know about it, it's one of the great hidden gems. And for those who don't, it's a real loss. And I'm pleased to say that we've had quite a few first time visitors in the last few weeks as people are venturing out, looking for open museums as a place uh, to find that and in the sanctum as such. But let me bring you back to, to its foundation, which for me was part of the, some kind of research I did during lockdown is to look into uh, the reopening and going through all the sort of newspapers of the time uh, to see what was written about it. And this I found was a photograph of the Wallace having just been uh, refurbished and prepared to open as a museum. You can see a, a policeman. We had the police were literally the security that we had at the time. And um, no less did the Royal Cavalry uh, Band come and play uh, a few tunes as the Prince of Wales, um, future King Edward, uh, came to officially open uh, the Wallace on the 25th of June, 1900. Now here he is walking in uh, into the Wallace collection and the speeches that uh, were made that are all transcribed in the Evening Standard uh, were very much about this, the celebration of this, this great gift of about 9,000 pieces, paintings, uh, porcelain, furniture, sculpture, arms and armor, the most astonishing collection that had been kept together uh, throughout the 19th century, and rather than being sold off in bits, uh, was offered to the nation in return for, for it to, being, to be looked after for, for generations um, uh, onwards. And this is here, the, this is, I'm showing you the great gallery, um, as it was in 1900, filled with pictures and furniture in the middle, uh, where these, these speeches uh, were made. Um, and the main focus was on Lady Wallace, who was the one that actually administered uh, the gift to the nation. I will come back to her later. But just to give you an idea of what this, this house museum looked like early on, um, there was right from the beginning a, a real sort of desire to make the collection quite sort of intimate, quite homely. They did put barriers around the uh, furniture, uh, but there, there was this wonderful symbi symbiosis between the paintings, the, 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 the clocks, the, the candelabras, the furniture as one. It really was uh, thought through as a collection that should be enjoyed where the, there was a, some kind of Gesundheitswerk, where all the arts played a role as one. Um, and of course, the papers um, reflected on the fact that this was probably one of the greatest collections of French paintings and decorative arts of the 18th century. Um, indeed, we have about 15 Vatos, uh, 25 Bouchers, and, and eight Fragonards. Um, and it was said, of course, that this was a collection that by far uh, outrank the National Gallery's collection of 18th century paintings. And, you know, one has to admit that the, eight, that the National Gallery resisted buying French paintings because they were hopeful that the Wallace collection would eventually come to them. Unfortunately for the National Gallery, that did not happen. And I'll explain why later on. But on the left, you've got the famous swing, uh, Fragonard swing, one of the most sort of erotic uh, paintings of the 18th century French Rococo. Um, <clears throat> wonderfully reused and frozen and tangled, so well known to uh, many children out there. We also have in the middle a cocotier, a, a, a very modern at the time way of, of making your boiled egg in the morning from your bed and belonged to Madame de Pompadour, mistress to Louis XV. She would have uh, placed some water, in, uh, a candle in here, boiled the water and the egg would have been placed on top. And then of course the hen laying the egg, you'd open it up and you'd have a lovely cooked egg. The beautiful Fragonard, no, sorry, Vato of, of, of one of the members of the Commedia dell'arte playing his, uh, his lute. And then this beautiful gilded uh, clock by uh, Gutier, one of the leading um, uh, guild bronze makers of the time. So in terms of the 18th century French, it became very famous for that. Interestingly, uh, the press and particularly the public were most attracted, not just by the 18th century, but also by a painting by Corot, um, a painting that shows um, Macbeth and Banker coming down the hill to meet the three witches. And I presume the Shakespearean story grabbed people's imagination. 
This is a painting that I will admit I did not know we had until lockdown when I did my rounds. I noticed it right up high hanging in one of our galleries. It's very dirty, it needs conservation, it needs its re removal of yellow varnishes. Uh, but it was a very famous picture back in the 19th century, 1858, it was exhibited at the Salon, and the young Monet, no less, saw it and was very excited by this very impressionistic way of, of, of painting. So it's a very important color which we need to, to bring back to the limelight, but that's some, a project that I need to think about for in future. Um, going back to the opening in 1900, uh, when it eventually opened to the public on a Monday morning at 10 o'clock, there were crowds, there was a queue. Um, we know from, again, the Evening Standard, that first, first three months, we saw 650,000 visitors uh, come to the Wallace to visit it. It was referred popularly as the El Dorado of, of museums because of the fact there's so much gold glittering. And at the front of the queue, uh, quite extraordinarily, was this young boy, uh, a local butcher boy, who came and was wanting to come in but uh, had forgotten to uh, leave behind the, the meat that he was meant to deliver uh, to the surrounding houses and was told by the policeman that uh, he could come back but without the meat. Um, and he said, you know, you can leave the meat with me. And the, you know, the boy said, no way, I, I, I better, I'll come back another time. But I think had Richard Wallace um, been alive uh, at this time, he would have been delighted because Richard Wallace, as a young man, uh, had a, uh, we don't know that much about him uh, in early stages of life, but we, what we do know is that the, at the age of eight years old, he was literally uh, dropped off by his mother, Agnes Jackson, in Paris in uh, 1819, um, and uh, was left with the mother of his supposed father, the uh, Marquis of Hartford. Uh, he grew up um, in the, the home of, of his supposed uh, grandmother um, in the uh, Rue Lafitte in Paris. Um, and there he, um, he had wanted to become a, a merchant and a banker, but his supposed father who never acknowledged him, uh, the fourth Marquis, whom I show you, you here, uh, was one of the greatest collectors of the time. He was a celibate, he never married, uh, but he spent all the money that he made through property, uh, mainly in Paris, London, and also his estates in Suffolk and Northern Ireland. He spent the money on buying some of the greatest pieces that you could possibly get on the art market, both in London and Paris. And he basically got Richard Wallace to become his private secretary. Um, and together they uh, went round the auction houses, the dealers. Um, sometimes Richard Wallace was sent as far as St. Petersburg and Istanbul. Here he is as a young man in his sort of mid thirties, but he was sent to buy things uh, for the, the collection a collection that resided mainly in Rue Lafitte, in storage, and also in a little sort of country house in the Bois de Boulogne, known as La Bagatelle, which still exists. Now, unfortunately, of course, uh, politically, uh, things were quite uh, delicate in France. Uh, there was the 1848 revolutions, and then, of course, there was the, um, the Commune and the, and the, uh, the Franco-Prussian War. And uh, the, as some of you will know, the Tuileries Palace was completely ransacked. Um, and, and burnt down, a lot of the art objects were, were destroyed. And Richard Wallace, um, who had in a way become the sort of curator of the collection, was extremely worried about this and decided to take the collection uh, for safekeeping, quite literally from Paris uh, to London. At the same time, he inherited uh, the collection himself because his uh, father, the fourth Marquis, uh, died in 1870. And to everybody's astonishment, uh, it was his illegitimate child who was to inherit the fortune, the collection, and some of the properties both in Paris um, and in London. But he did not inherit the title, which still carries on with the present family we, we have on our board of trustees, the ninth Marquis of Hartford. So he did inherit that, but he uh, was able to inherit the, the fortune. And in a way, um, I, one suspects that the uh, Marquis of Hartford basically instructed him uh, to keep this collection together, to look after it. And this he did with great uh, zest, as, as you will see. Um, what we have here is a portrait of, of Richard Wallace having just inherited, but uh, using his wealth for a great philanthropic um, uh, endeavors. Um, so you have him in the middle here, but when you look closely, you'll see 
on the top left, uh, Fortune, Charity. Uh, you'll see the famous Wallace Fountains, fountains that um, uh, were dotted around Paris, about 45 of them, specially designed and commissioned uh, by Richard Wallace, so that the French, the Parisians could have fresh drinking water, which was very hard to come by, particularly after the Franco-Prussian War. Um, and these still exist, they still function amazingly. And it's my great wish we could one day bring them over to London where there are very few drinking fountains, particularly on hot days. Um, but this just gives you an idea of, of, the, of the charitable um, works that he was involved with. He even set up a British hospital in Paris, which still exists. And um, indeed here, but he remained interestingly a, a, a sort of Englishman um, in, in Paris. So he, of course he spoke perfect French, but he was a uh, British uh, right through would have gone to St. George's Church in Paris. And here you have uh, the allegory of Britannia, Britain, uh, helping Gallia, France, uh, through its hard times, with, in the middle, um, the coat of arms that uh, Richard Wallace would take on with Espérance, hope, uh, as, as, uh, as a sort of logo. And what's fascinating about Richard Wallace, we, again, he left very little about you know, what he thought, uh, who he saw, he, there, were, there are no diaries that we know of. All we have really as a testament is the collection he looked after and the collection that he built up following the death of his father. And he acquired this very beautiful piece of 16th century um, Ausberg silver, a ostrich, um, very soon after his inheritance, which shows uh, the, the ostrich with the um, horseshoe, holding the horseshoe, very like the symbol of his, uh, uh, of his uh, coat of arms. Now, Traditionally, uh, it, is, uh, it was believed that ostriches could digest metal. And indeed, uh, when you read Pliny the Elder, uh, you do get these extraordinary descriptions of these poor uh, ostriches being fed nails in order to find out if they could really digest. Now, I, I didn't believe it, but actually they do, they can, with small measures of metal, they can actually digest metal. Um, but the, the fascinating thing is that throughout the mid medieval ages, uh, the ostrich became a symbol of, of fortitude because of its ability to digest uh, such hard material. Um, and indeed, um, it seems that Richard Wallace was very taken aback by the, this, that sort of anecdote and turned and looked at it as, a, as his uh, coat of arms. But interesting to see that the collector here, buying a very beautiful piece of, and fine piece of silver, uh, should sort of see himself in, in such an object. Richard Wallace in London is a fascinating subject in itself. He, he became a sort of Victorian dandy philanthropist. He was a trustee at the National Gallery, uh, gave paintings to the National Gallery, uh, helped the v &A acquire a few pieces as well. Um, he was a very a sort of instrumental in many ways uh, within the sort of um, uh, acts of charity uh, throughout uh, London. And indeed, when he decided to uh, buy Hartford House, which had belonged to the Marquesses of Hartford from the fifth Marquess, he decided to refurbish it completely. Uh, it needed uh, modernization, but it mainly needed extra space to hold the collection that he was gonna bring back from Paris. And while he did that, he decided to lend for, the, for three years, uh, pretty much 90% of his collection to Bethnal Green Museum, which is today the Museum of Childhood uh, run by the V&A. Uh, but in those days, it was a sort of a large exhibition hall, still run actually by the South Kensington Museums. And it was, an, it was a sort of early attempt to, to try and provide culture for the East End, uh, where of course it was more mainly working class uh, people living there. And this was met with, with great sort of, um, uh, sort of uh, admiration, but also gratitude by the British public. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if Richard Wallace, uh, when he saw his collection being so uh, you know, appreciated and looked at, and here you have a, a newspaper cutting where you see, uh, and there's a, a line that goes with this, the working class as, as connoisseurs. Uh, but you know, the fact that he could share his collection with the greater public really, I am sure, uh, inspired him to eventually give, through his wife, Lady Wallace, and the, the collection to the nation so that it could be seen and, and, and loved by, by everybody. But uh, astonishingly, you know, a good 5 million visitors came to see uh, the, ex the exhibition. And one could almost say that it was one of the sort of early blockbusters uh, of the time. 
Meanwhile, Richard Warren has refurbished the, the, the house, Hartford House. He built a, a courtyard, he added stables, um, he added rooms and the Great Gallery was one of them in order to hold the pictures. Um, and this is an early uh, shot of the courtyard, which as you will see is now today our, our sort of covered uh, restaurant. Um, but one room that I personally uh, like and intrigued by and, and would love to somehow uh, reconstruct because as you'll see it has changed quite a bit since was his very private and intimate smoking room uh, which he decorated with these beautiful tiles uh, sort of inspired by the sort of Iznik Turkish um, uh, manner which and you have to remember this is uh, 1875 when he did this so this is before Leighton House where you have this wonderful sort of arabesque uh, decoration uh, looking towards the east for inspiration and in this uh, room, he would um, sit and smoke his hookah pipes, which we still have in our reserve collection, which one day I would like to bring out somehow. Uh, but he would sit there and, and dress um, in his uh, smoking jacket. I'll, I'll have to find the smoking jacket. Sorry. Here he is in his smoking jacket um, and handle his most beautiful objects, probably, and appreciate them. And we've just discovered quite literally during lockdown that there was a side entrance so he could invite pretty much anybody he wanted to um, in a sort of on the sort of private way without having to announce themselves at the at the main entrance of the Wallace, uh, but they could come through the site and enter this special space uh, that he created um, uh, in order to enjoy uh, his sort of private uh, passion for the arts. So this is the room today, as you can see in quite typical Wallace style, it is extremely cluttered. Um, the lighting is all over the place. Um, the, we have, you know, Mallorca, we have uh, coins and medals, we have all kinds of things, which is, of course, part of the charm of the Wallace. But um, I think under Wallace himself, it would have probably been a bit better curated. And this is something I'm very keen to try and think about in the, in the long term. Uh, here's another shot of the gallery during uh, the time it became a museum. So they kept the wonderful uh, tiles. And unfortunately, in the 1960s, uh, they decided to remove all the tiles. Uh, but leave them only in the alcove that I'm showing in the, here in the distance, an alcove where we have this lovely sort of uh, sculpture of a cupid, um, but um, which you know should go somewhere else, um, really, because it's a, it's a tight space. But you, when you look at these beautiful tiles, um, wouldn't it be extraordinary to reconstruct that space and, and rethink it as, a, as a, an area where maybe East and West meets, all the different cultures meet, and we do have indeed some some of the most beautiful examples of 16th century isnic uh, ceramics in our collection which are uh, incredibly rare um, in this country um, so here he is again um, as, as wearing his this is towards the end of his life he's holding one of his recent acquisitions a, an algardi figure of a flagellant and indeed um, we've got the two um, the, with the when he bought them he didn't have the image of christ in the middle and this was a very interesting sort of secret acquisition that was done uh, by the trustees in the 1930s in order to, to sort of finish off the group, uh, which is interesting in itself. That um, when uh, you, I'll tell you more about the will from Lady Wallace's uh, point of view that you couldn't add or, or subtract from the collection. So um, I'm not going to get entangled in this, but uh, interesting that they wanted to complete the group um, so that they made sense to have the flagellants actually whipping Christ in the middle. But um, Richard Wallace's taste is, is a very interesting subject in itself. His father uh, loved the 18th century French, so one would, can safely say that most of that part of the collection was his father's um, um, orientation. Meanwhile, Richard Wallace was much more interested in the sort of um, Kunsthammer, the idea of, of, of collecting works of art, very precious objects, objects that were very beautifully crafted and sometimes happened to belong to important people. And here he commissioned a contemporary French painter to, to make basically paint a still life of all his most recent acquisitions, uh, acquisitions that were at the time incredibly famous and important. So for example, here we have this beautiful uh, piece by a 15th century um, uh, Paduan sculptor called Pomerano, which shows Hercules um, in this wonderful contraposto pose looking out, it's a, quite a small figure, it's about 10 to 15 centimeters high. It's made out of boxwood, uh, but it is one of the most beautiful sort of Renaissance pieces that we have here. Something that you would normally expect uh, at the V&A, for example, 
but here it is, uh, and something that he bought at, at a very high price at the time. Also made out of boxwood is this fantastic uh, triptych um, that comes from the Netherlands, 15th century. Um, it's, the, it's a sort of a series of, 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 of scenes of the nativity, but done with such uh, extraordinary microscopic detail. Uh, even when you come and see it in the original, it's very difficult to see. You need to use a, a magnifying glass to fully appreciate the dexterity in which this object has been made. But these are the kind of objects he, he particularly took delight in, in buying. But he was also quite sort of globally orientated. And when these came up in the Perrier sale of, in the 1870s, uh, he automatically bought them. They are Chinese cups uh, made specially for the uh, Chinese emperor in the 18th century, the Xilong dynasty. And they made that solid gold and covered with rubies and emerald, emeralds. They have written in Chinese um, as a sort of a mantra about uh, the, the, the emperor that he would drink these um, on New Year's Eve uh, in order to sort of uh, express his, his delight for his kingdom and, and the freedom of speech <laughs> at the time. So they're very symbolic. They're part of a, of a very important ritual. There are only four of these cups that survive today. One is in Beijing, the other one is in Taiwan, and the other two are here in the Wallace collection. They are exquisite in their uh, sort of detail, but also uh, in the fact that they've survived the test of time very beautifully. And many people might be excused that when you see that blue from a distance, they might think it's um, a smolt or, or enamel, but it is made out of kingfisher feathers, which is astonishing the way it's been very carefully uh, positioned around the writing and, and the, the sort of florid decoration. So these are, uh, again, treasures that not, not many people realize we have here, uh, but are to be discovered as part of one's visit to the Wallace collection. But he also bought African art. And this is actually the, a piece of, of sculpture uh, that um, when I saw it and when I was preparing for my interviews here four years ago, when I came across this, I was so astonished, it actually convinced me that I had to go for the job here because it's not a collection that is just about painting or, or, or decorative arts, it's also a, a global collection in itself. And this uh, head was comes from um, present day Ghana from the Ashante people, uh, the capital being Kumasi. Um, it's um, one of a very rare survival of the, the extraordinary craft of, of goldsmiths that there was a, a, a done there and still is very much alive today actually uh, but it's one of the most important sort of full-size heads portraits possibly uh, we think of one of the victims of the Ashante they, the the practice was they would execute them um, but then make these wonderful sort of effigies uh, images of them and then attach these heads to their swords and then do some kind of ritual dance uh, we have yet to do much more research on these uh, but these, it has to be said that this is quite topical nowadays, and I'll be open. This was looted uh, by the British forces uh, during the punitive wars uh, against the Ashante in the 18, uh, late 60s, 1870s. And uh, Richard Wallace bought them at, uh, from the crown jeweler, no less, uh, something called Garrard's, and, uh, and acquired them along with other museums who acquired similar pieces. Um, so it's uh, quite topical from, from a sort of Black Lives Matter point of view. But, Again, an object that sh people should come and see because it's here available for free and, and should be uh, you know, discussed. Museums are here uh, to, for, where we can have open discussions about uh, such works and their meaning, uh, particularly to, for people of today. Also, he, uh, Richard Wallace acquired uh, this Celtic bell. Uh, again, an astonishing uh, example of, of, of 10th century Celtic art in the form of a reliquary bell that belonged to St. Mura from County Donegal. Um, and it's just, uh, again, as an object, uh, the fact that Richard Wallace would take some pleasure from studying it, understanding it, um, I think is, is quite sort of a, a revelatory of, of the type of collector he was. And he even bought um, uh, this rock crystal of the um, Good Shepherd, Christ as a Good Shepherd, made out of rock crystal. It's a tiny figure, it's about as big as my, my fist. And it comes from uh, present day Goa. It was Indo-Portuguese um, made in the probably 18th century. Again, a very rare survival. There's only five of these uh, today. Uh, but this wonderful sort of pose of it's quite melancholic pose as the Christ child brings his hand to his head. Uh, he's sitting on this beautiful pillow and the tassels, when you walk around this, uh, vibrate in, 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 the, 
in the space um, as you look at it. It's uh, an extraordinary sort of uh, feat of, of, of art, but at the same time, these were probably made by artists who could come up with a Christ figure for you or a little Vishnu if need be. So this is where you get this wonderful sort of uh, hybrid of style, but also of hybrids of, of religions, uh, particularly in the, in the Portuguese uh, Goa at the time. So that's another object to look out for if you do come. Richard Wallace was also the one that was particularly uh, attracted to uh, buying uh, arms and armor. He bought collections as one and added to them. Uh, he bought uh, arms and armor, some of, most of them are, were sort of ex wonderful examples of different schools from the Altspo school, from the Nuremberg school, from the Melanese school, from the Toledo school. Uh, so he was very keen to represent the different traditions of armor making uh, throughout Europe. And the way he displayed it was quite astonishing. It's almost like a sort of baronial hall. And, you know, one is tempted to try and reconstruct that kind of, of exhibit. Of course, um, the exhibit becomes more of a showcase rather than looking at individual objects. But um, as you'll see towards the end of the lecture, we're, we are rethinking about the display of our arms and armor. And, and one of the great pieces is this 15th century uh, medieval armor, um, which actually is 1390s, so 14th century, um, made probably in, in, in southern Germany. Uh, but uh, it's one of the greatest and, and rarest survivals of such armor, uh, particularly for horse armor. Um, and the fact that it's still being kept together. Um, normally armor gets um, divided and, and bits get added and you never have quite a pure suit of armor. Uh, but this one is, is, a, is, a, is a rare survival. Um, and you know, when you look at the, the way that just the engineering that's involved in as the horse starts galloping, you want the plates to, to move against each other, but seamlessly, uh, and they need to be well oiled in order for them to be functioning and to be worn, but also to be protective, of course. So these are the kind of things that uh, one can discover here. Um, but he not only co uh, collected uh, European armor, he was also fascinated by armor from the Ottoman Empire, from Mughal India, um, from um, uh, Persia. So that, that was another gallery that he, he created, which he, he called the Oriental Armory, which is again, a, a term that we might find difficult to, to use these days, but we still use it and again, um, some of my younger curators are, are, you know, asking questions about that. But the way Richard Wallace exhibited it was that he even had little sort of painted stars on the roof. So he really saw this as a sort of a mise en scène as such in the way he exhibited his works. And amongst them was probably one of the most important uh, examples of Mughal 17th century um, jewellery work, but in the form of this dagger that belonged to Shah Jahan, uh, who is, of course, famous for building the Taj Mahal. Uh, but again, this, this exquisite piece of, of, uh, of, of jewelry, really, uh, where we've got the gold and the emeralds and the rubies, and then this sort of face that looks like a, a half lion, half tiger coming out of the, of the pommel of the, of the, of the um, dagger. Again, it's, uh, it just gives you an idea of, of that he was, that Richard was not, was not only interested in the exquisite uh, sort of execution of these objects, but also possibly by who they belong to. And one could, give a lecture on Richard Wallace collecting works that belong to famous people. We have, for example, Henry IV, uh, King of France's dagger in the collection. Dagger that of great importance, but the biographical background is, is just as important. But the, the piece de resistance for Richard Wallace was the Great Gallery. He built it specially on top of the stables to house what was possibly one of the greatest collection of old master paintings, uh, includes the famous Laughing Cavalier, which the, his father bought uh, for 51,000 francs in the 1860s, managed to outbid James the Rothschild. And I like to remind any Rothschild that visit the Wallace collection that uh, this was the case, that they were outbid for once. Uh, but um, it's one of our great sort of icons uh, here, the sort of equivalent to the girl with the pearl earring maybe uh, for the Moritz house. Um, but it's uh, one of these enigmatic pictures that we, one day we'll be investigating a lot more, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. We also have these wonderful uh, full-length portraits of, by Van Dyck of uh, Philippe Leroy and his, his wife. Um, again, very formal portraits, but a formality broken by the dogs, Greyhound looking very faithfully up to his um, master, and then this little King Charles Spaniel, slightly frightened, 
maybe by the dog, or is she, or is, or is this little dog mimicking or emulating the slight fear that this young wife to be um, is is going to have to experience the the rather hard looking um, male um, <laughs> companion that we have before us. Um, but the Richard Wallace in his own day. Uh, was a, a great socialite, a uh, great lender to exhibitions. He loved sharing his collection with the greater public. And this is a wonderful uh, image of him. Here's Richard Wallace uh, with his contemporaries at an exhibition at the Royal Academy. And you can see at the back the two Van Dykes that he uh, lent uh, to this exhibition. Um, sadly, Richard Wallace died in 1890. Um, he spent the last two years in Paris. Interestingly, he wasn't in London. He's buried in, in Père Lachaise Cemetery, uh, interestingly, with his father. Uh, so the, the, the mausoleum is known as the Hartford Wallace um, Mausoleum, uh, worth paying homage to, as one should do if one is director of this institution, so hence the rose of it. But um, uh, interesting that uh, you know, Wallace, having been the illegitimate child, was still remained very much part of the family uh, throughout his life. Um, and, and this is his resting place. His wife survived him by seven years. His wife was French. They'd met, uh, she had been a perfume seller in Galerie Lafayette. They didn't marry until the fourth Marquis had died. So one suggests that the fourth Marquis never acknowledged her really, but um, she was a collector in her own right. Um, she, we don't know that much about her, but she is key for having um, basically administered um, the, the gift to the nation. She was held by her private secretary, John Scott Murray. Uh, so together they, they wrote up the, the will. And uh, when she died, um, a committee was set up by the government to inquire and report on her, her will. And uh, a very interesting group of, of, of people at the time, more research has to be done on these people, but one of them being Sir Edward Pointer, who he was a director of the National Gallery. He played a very key role in how to um, understand her will, which I'll come to in a minute. Uh, but you also had Alfred Rothschild, collector and banker, who um, himself was, was very uh, key, a key player in terms of how the Wallace should look. But interestingly, the big debate about her, her will was, uh, first of all, um, I mean, uh, you can read this in your spare time, but she basically says, I bequeath to the British nation, my pictures, porcelain, bronzes, uh, but on the express condition that the government for the time being shall agree to give a site in central London um, and build thereon a special museum to contain the said collection. And then she says, which shall always be kept together, unmixed with other objects and be called the Wallace collection. So from, from there, you can see that uh, she's very keen that this should be called the Wallace collection. So not the Hartford collection, for example, that she's not giving the house, that uh, the government should build a museum in central London. And then at the end, if you look, and she says that, uh, make sure that the um, balustrade, uh, which is basically the staircase, should be part of this new museum. Now, the, there was a lot of debate, a lot of discussion, what did she mean by building a, a special museum in central London? And indeed, um, you know, they, the, the committee decided, well, if we are gonna build something for the Wallace collection, where should it be? Should it be near the V&A? Uh, should it be, uh, as the National Gallery director really wanted it to be as a wing, uh, separate to the National Gallery, but uh, together, unmixed with the collection, but uh, called the Wallace Collection. And indeed, the pointer was saying, why don't you build a special wing, quite literally where the Sainsbury wing is today. Um, and imagine if that had been the case, the Wallace Collection would have been direct neighbors with the National Gallery. And he even said, pointer even said, let's build a bridge between the two so that people can go in and out uh, from one collection to the other. Um, in the end, uh, it was decided that it would be cheaper and easier, <laughs> and that's quite typical of the government, uh, to not build anything, but to buy back the house, the lease from the Portman estate, and leave the staircase where it was, which I'm showing you now, uh, which is of course a, a wonderful sort of, uh, sort of introduction to the collection when walks in from the square uh, even today. Um, and basically transformed the house into a museum. And um, this is a very interesting moment really where a museum that had been housed becomes sort of a publicly orientated uh, space. 
And it's something that we maybe, I don't know if we struggle together or about it, but it's very much part of the charm of coming to the Wallis that it is intimate, that it is house-like, and yet it's still a museum. Uh, so, you know, you can't touch things, but um, it has that very special, um, uh, and indeed, when it opened, people were delighted by the idea that they were being able to enter what had been a private house. Um, having said that, Richard Wallace was always keen to have visitors, and we do have the visitor's book uh, that still survives. And we know that people like Rodin, the sculptor, came and, and many other illustrious collectors and, and artists. Uh, but the fact that it was suddenly open to the public, um, I think, really captured people's imagination, at least uh, before the First World War. Um, and here is an early shot of the, of the museum with its staircase and how it would have looked for, for the visitor at the time. And at the top of the stairs, you would have been greeted by Lady Wallace herself in the middle, her husband to the right. So very interesting that here we have a woman who is the one behind the gift. And indeed, I found this in storage, uh, the actual cartouche, which you see behind her, uh, that basically tells you exactly that this Wallace collection was bequeathed to the British nation by Amélie, widow of Sir Richard Wallace. Um, so very interesting that, you know, we refer to Wallace, uh, and Sir Richard Wallace, but actually Lady Wallace was, was the prime instigator in, in, in the gift. So that's something that we need to, to be much more aware of. Now today, um, you know, well, what's interesting, I would say, is that um, once it became public, um, the house sort of had a, a bit of a sort of existential uh, moment where because it looks like a house, it doesn't look like the typical museum with the sort of big sort of classical facade. And therefore it's public nature, even though we belong to the government, uh, taxpayers pay uh, through the grant and aid scheme, um, the, uh, the, the sort of looking after the museum. And indeed, when we first opened, it was 100% uh, sponsored by the government. Unfortunately, now it's gone right down to 40%. Um, but it, one could say that uh, throughout the, particularly between the two wars and after the Second World War, the Wallace really became quite a sort of dark and, and not very well known and not well visited place. Uh, it saw a sort of resurgence really in people's imagination throughout the 90s and particularly in the early 2000s. So, you know, relatively recent, which is quite extraordinary. Um, and that mainly was thanks to the restaurant that was built in the middle of the Wallace in the courtyard, which was covered up by Rick Mather and, and his architects. And here I show you a, a scene that unfortunately, you know, is no longer at the moment anyway, of lots of people enjoying a, a delicious lunch at the Wallace. But um, as a museum of the 21st century, the restaurant is very important. We survive uh, a lot from that. We do events and weddings. And most recently, uh, we've had uh, uh, our first uh, sort of series of exhibitions that uh, are fee charging that we, we have to pay admission for. Uh, we had Richard Wallace, the collector, as a way of, of <clears throat> celebrating Richard Wallace and his, his, his life and his collecting habits as the first exhibition. Um, then we moved through uh, The Helmet Heads by Henry Moore, and I'll tell you more in a minute, uh, Manolo Blahnik, uh, The Shoes. <laughs> that he exhibited here. Uh, we collaborated with him in, in showing his shoes uh, next to some of the great masterpieces. And then most recently, uh, Forgotten Masters, an exhibition on Indian painting, a uh, guest created by William Darwinville. And, and this is it here, uh, a show that was doing exceptionally well uh, before the lockdown in March. Where we were seeing about 5,000 people visiting uh, per week, which was a, a major record for the Wallace. Um, the catalogue is still on self online, so do, do get it if you, you're interested. But it was a wonderful show, which um, was full of color, full of life, and was a, an opportunity to not only engage with our collection of Mughal armor, because this dagger happened to belong to a Frenchman who was a member of the East India Company, somebody called Claude Martin. And he was one of the first people to start employing um, Indian Persian trained artists to depict the world around him. He was very keen to capture uh, the nature, the fauna and the animals of India and create these amazing albums, which are about a meter wide. And here's one of the beautiful Indian fruit bats that he uh, commissioned. Um, but it was a show that was about animals, but also the people of India. And uh, it, it really attracted a lot of people. And William Darable being a, a famous author uh, was the perfect sort of conduit into this, this unknown world, really. These, these artists are completely forgotten today. 
previously to that, we've done the next mission of Henry Moore, the helmet heads. Henry Moore loved Wallace. He came here a lot to look at the armor, particularly the helmets in our collection. Amazingly, the way we show the arms and armor collection hasn't changed since 1908. So what you see is what Henry Moore would have seen. And his responses are absolutely fascinating. Um, and one could give a lecture uh, <laughs> on its own about this, but it's uh, amazing to see a sculptor like Henry Moore, who was very attracted by the exterior form, but fascinated by what was going on in the middle of that helmet in that sort of dark cavity and coming up with his own sort of sculptural expression of that in the, in the sort of sanctum of the, of the helmet. And we did this wonderful show where we made, uh, were able to juxtapose his sculptures with, with the helmets. And then Manolo Blanik, he, as you, some of you might know, he designed some of the most beautiful shoes for ladies and men now, um, but he loves the Wallace. He's been coming here for the last 40 years. He's one of these artists who, or fashion designers who takes different bits from the collection and reworks them into his shoes. Here he is at the opening looking rather dashing. <laughs> uh, but you know, just to see his shoes next to, it, it was a very interesting experience for us because one, we brought in a completely new audience and of course a much younger audience, um, as well as those who love Manolo shoes anyway. But just to see the, the craftsmanship involved in the shoe, the shape, but also the embroidery and then contrasting it quite literally with the, the gilt bronze that makes up the decoration of some of our furniture. Uh, I think my own curators and my own staff were sort of reappreciated how a collection such as ours can be a, a, a total inspiration. And we exhibited them in, in these little lovely bell jars to give them a sort of exotic butterfly-like uh, quality, but it was tremendously successful. And um, we saw many new visitors to the Wallace. And then quite literally during the Manolo Blanik um, exhibition, we managed to be able to interpret Lady Wallace's will in a slightly more flexible manner. Uh, until uh, 2019, the will was exp uh, understood to, be, to, be, to basically tell you that you could not lend, nothing could leave the collection, that the collection shall always stay together and unmixed with other objects. I think from my point of view, the interpretation should be that nothing should be broken up. The collection should not be sold or split up between other national museums. I think Lady Wallace was very keen that the collection that had been brought together by her husband and, and his father and grandfathers should uh, remain together as one and hence be called the Wallace Collection. So it meant that she didn't want the, all the paintings, for example, to go to the National Gallery. She didn't want the Serve collection of porcelain to go to the v &A and be split up. No, she wanted to be kept together. And um, mixed, not be mixed, she didn't want anybody to add to the collection. No acquisitions, no special gifts, um, no Sachi collection that should come to the world. You know, keep it pure. And indeed, the result is that it is a capsule of time, particularly from a, a collector's point of view. But it doesn't say that thou shall not lend. And as I said earlier, they were very key lenders in their own lifetime and would have been proud to be able to share their collection and see it in different ways. And indeed, uh, this is what uh, sort of allowed us to really to rethink it, particularly at the Wallace's position in today's uh, museum world, the ability nowadays to collaborate and, and really learn more from one's collection by lending and borrowing and, and being able to do exhibitions. So most recently, the first loan was the Titian that we have here, wonderful Titian by uh, that shows Perseus Andromeda. It was part of the series of six paintings that Titian painted for the King of Spain, Philip II, and the National Gallery were putting on a very important exhibition that was for the first time since the 16th, late 16th century, was reuniting all these masterpieces. And it would have been a really a, well, a shame, but also quite shocking that the Wallace, only two miles away from the National Gallery, should not be able to participate in this historical moment and also learn from it. And I urge you to go and see the show, which is still on, um, just to see how our beautiful nude of Andromeda compares with the other news, but also in terms of composition and, and narrative and the connections that Titian makes uh, throughout these pictures um, is, is absolutely fascinating. And this is a, a very rare moment. And we've just been able to uh, convince the trustees that we should also lend to Madrid. So the picture will, go on to, will be going back to Spain, quite literally, uh, to the Prado and then on to Boston, which is very good news. So um, we'll get the Wallace will, it's a way of making the Wallace better known uh, beyond uh, Manchester Square, uh, quite literally. 
And of course, you know, we, we like to think that we can maybe borrow something back. Uh, and the, in the sp spirit of collaboration, um, we will be uh, in May reuniting for the first time since 1803, the great landscapes by, by Rubens, uh, painted towards the end of his life for his own uh, his country house, uh, a place called Hetstein, just outside Antwerp. Uh, we have the famous rainbow landscape, uh, where you see this beautiful rainbow, it's just rained, uh, everybody's coming out, people and animals are coming out of their shelter uh, to re-engage with the daily routine. And they will be paired again uh, with the National Gallery's painting of, of Hetstein, the actual manor house we see here, um, a sort of a cart, carriage taking a, a calf to market, and then this huntsman about to shoot some partridge share. This picture is being cleaned at this very moment by the National Gallery, and it will be a total revelation, not only to see it clean, but to see it next to its pendant for the first time. And so we'll have this very simple show, the two pictures together, um, facing each other, and it should be hopefully post-COVID, hopefully we'll be out of this uh, terrible situation. And these pictures will be, you know, about hope and, and, and uh, recovery, let us hope. Um, but being the, a director and, and looking after the Wallace Collection at this very moment is a bit like doing a handstand, it's about balance. Um, we've just had to have all our staff, we're, pretty much, we're all on furlough until um, early um, October, some are still on furlough. So we're slowly uh, picking up the pieces. Um, it's going to be very difficult uh, from now on, I think, but we're, we're trying to, to do our very best, first of all, to stay open, to make sure that people can come and visit. Um, engaging with great art is uh, a, you know, a very important um, moment, really, for individuals. It, it provides solace, it provides inspiration, uh, and I think beauty has a great healing power. There's no doubt about it. Um, so, you know, I think great art fills the void, quite literally. And um, as part of this, um, we are at this very moment, I've just been downstairs, we are going to be doing something that's quite different to what we normally do, but because the restaurant is still shut, but is it's opening next Friday with social distancing in place, so we'll have quite a lot of space between each table and only groups of six will be able to have their lunch or coffee. But it's an opportunity to try something that I've always wanted to do, uh, which is to bring uh, slowly, perhaps, the arms and armor collection into the courtyard. Now, of course, any museum needs a good restaurant or, or cafe, and I'll have to rethink that eventually, but maybe not just now. But this is an opportunity to, to combine the two and to have that grace great knight in armor that I showed you earlier, right in the middle of the courtyard and allow people to, you know, have their coffee around it, but to be able to admire one of the greatest pieces in natural light with proper space around it. And it will be very interesting to see how it looks. And I'm hoping that this will be not only an attraction for uh, families and, and the public alike, but also a symbol of our, our fight <laughs> against COVID-19 itself. And um, I'm very keen, I, I very much admire what the National Gallery is, is doing now with Artemisia Gentileschi. They've opened this, the exhibition. They've, they've gone on uh, regardless. And I think it's important that museums don't give up. They don't sort of close down again or, or forget about any kind of programming. So in autumn 2021, I hope I'm not being mad, but we are going to be opening an exhibition on the male portraits, basically providing our Laughing Cavalier with his friends by uniting a, a very, very well selected group of about 14 portraits of, of male sitters dating right from the early part of his career from 1616, right to the end of his career of the 1660s. And you'll see a, a painter develop his stylistically, but also get more and more sort of adventurous in his way of portraying his sitters and also maybe uh, capturing a, a psychology that maybe is not so present in the early portraits becomes particularly uh, um, present towards the end of his career. So it's an opportunity, I mean, I will hang this show with two meters between each portrait, so it will be socially distant, respectful, um, but it's an opportunity also to, to really engage with one of our greatest masterpieces, which has never been seen in context. So I just wanted to end with the, a quote from the Evening Standard, once the Prince of Wales had seen the collection, he was delighted, and with his friends took tea in one of the lower galleries. Um, invitations have been issued for today to the members of both Houses of Parliament, to the government services and others, 
4,500 in all. And on Monday at 10 o'clock, the galleries will, for the first time, be thrown open to the public. And all I have to say really is, may we stay open forevermore. So thank you very much for listening. And I'd be delighted to receive any questions that you might have. I'm just going to shut the blinds. Thank you so much, Xavier. Thank you. Um, I wonder, would anyone like to ask a question? If you might just um, put, you, just type into the chat if you'd like to ask a question. Overall. I might start with that one if that's okay. I, I kept coming up with questions and then you kept answering them. Um, I, was, I was thinking about how, you know, a historical collection stays with the times or whether that's something that is even a, a, a desire of a, of, a, of a museum like the Wallace collection, but you seem to have done it in a really bold way and you know how you've interpreted the will and um, really just opened up the collection in a, in a, in a, in a fantastic way. Um, I, I did have another question about your work in terms of being the director. Do you, do you still have the opportunity to curate as well? Um, uh, that's a good question. I mean, of course, this is the hardest part of becoming a director. Having been a curator, you, you find it very hard to let go of that, the, those areas. And I certainly try and not be a micromanager, but I suppose the way, the way I regard it now is it's a bit like being a producer or, or sort of <laughs> conductor of an orchestra where you, 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 you make sure what, all your creators are involved with exciting projects and you dip in and you, you, know, you sort of challenge them, you advise them. Um, and um, so that's with the collection in itself, the way we think about the collection, the way we present it. And then with exhibitions, I, again, I, I'm very keen to, to let curators develop their own ideas. And, and, but I definitely love, you know, coming to see what their hang is looking like and, and advise and, and sometimes, you know, make decisions <laughs> that I think will be uh, the right ones in, in the end. I mean, it's, it's a very fine balance. In terms of my own work, I mean, I, of course, I, I my area of speciality is Spanish art. And if I can, I do try and lecture and write articles, but I have to admit, um, I don't think I've ever worked so hard during lockdown. I thought it was gonna be the perfect time to become a scholar again, but uh, it all became about how survival and, and just keeping the, the ship afloat. So um, so yeah, it's it's difficult, but um, I think personally, I've, I've taken great sort of uh, inspiration from the collection itself. and and. There is so much to discover here. It's a bit like a mini hermitage whereby you could spend a lifetime looking at, at an object and not realizing you had it. So the other day I, I discovered a, a broken piece of Mallorca, which you know, I would have never noticed. It's a fragment and yet it's a beautiful fragment with you know, great figures on it. And I was delighted to, to see it and, and discover it. So no, yeah, it's, the Wallace Collection has been, become my sort of main focus of study as such. Fantastic. Um, I've just been sent another message um, and I'll just read it out because it's, it, it's, a, it's a lovely one. The Wallace collection is an absolute gem, like the BM, v &A, and gallery all in one. As a director, what do you think is the greatest challenge in terms of displaying such a range of objects in one place? It's a massive challenge. Um, I think many visitors today are not used to to uh, coming across such a collection, and I would say would probably feel overwhelmed, and I'm not quite sure what they should be looking at, and um, and how to go about it. And that's something that we need to work out either through audio guides. We do have uh, this this app, Smartify, which image recognizes for your phone, but then not everybody uses the phone, so it's it's a difficult one. And um, it's very interesting to look at how the gallery was displayed throughout the 20th century. So one of the directors, John Ingemel's was more of a picture man. And he really wanted the pictures to look beautiful. He, he um, reduced the hang, so he didn't have as much up. Um, so it was much more like the National Gallery, very select hang. Some people appreciated that. Some people said it didn't look ha homely enough. So I think we will always have that sort of um, um, friction really between the house collection, where you have loads of stuff everywhere, and the, the museum, which is you know, more didactic. And that's why I was very keen that we do have an exhibition space. The exhibition space is a great moment to take something out from upstairs, bring it downstairs and just see it in totally different light, uh, quite literally in a new context. And that's something that I learned at the National Gallery when I trained there, that that's you know, one of the big aims. And uh, the nice thing about the wireless is you can do it with the paintings, but you can do it with the sculpture, with the, the uh, porcelain, the, the furniture. So 
that's something that I want to, to develop for, for sure. In terms, I think the big challenge for us at the moment is the arms and armor galleries. I think they are very cluttered. They're very romantic. They're very attractive. There's a sort of sense of going back into the past. And I, I'm very conscious that I don't want to change it too much, but at the same time, I want to maybe light it better, maybe make sure people know which objects are true masterpieces. So there are ways of doing that. So if we ever refurbish them, it will have to be a very uh, you know, subtle, cautious, retrofitting maybe, uh, but that's something that we'll keep discussing with my curators. And I do think that the courtyard you know, when I go to the Met, I just love the way they show things at the Met, particularly the arms and armor. They have, you know, eight horses with uh, arms and, you know, knights sitting there. It's so impressive. And it's the kind of thing that would leave a, a very strong mark on, on our younger generations, who interestingly love the Wallace because it feels like visiting their granny's house or something like that, you know, but it has that sort of intimacy that they appreciate. Well, we have a plea here from Anna not to change the arms and armor too Perfect. much. <laughs> and I'm sure that's the thing. I, I, I will. There will be a lot of resistance. Of People course. love the Wallace as it is, and I remember when I first joined, they said you know, I was warned, "Don't change it too much." And I agree. The, the the difficult thing is that we do have to adapt to to the present day, and and, you know, and I think it's let's find the middle way is what I'm looking for at the moment. So, um, so I see a question that uh, we've moved to tier two. Yeah, um, so from my point of view, and uh, and I'm sure my staff will agree, we are going to stay open, and um, I think cultural institutions uh, are staying open. The The irony is that visiting any museum at the moment is probably the safest uh, thing to do. Now, of course, getting here is the issue. Um, so if you can walk, that's the safest. If you can cycle, that's the next safest. Um, and if you don't mind taking public transport, that, of course, that's the way to do it, or you can drive. Of course, but um, we are going to stay open. Uh, we um, we are we have seen a, a very low visitor attendance, which is incredibly worrying, because at the moment the only way we can make any sort of commercial transaction is through the shop. Um, and again, unfortunately, the London public who do does come are not spenders, unlike the tourist. So you know we that suddenly realise what you know what keeps us going, and that is tourism, uh, events, um, you know public events private corporate events. So that's all gone. So it is very worrying. And um, I hope the government understands that. We've done our best to explain it to the Treasury. We are all waiting for the spending review coming up in November. So that is going to be the great moment when we, we have to sort of decide how we're going to carry on and if we can. Uh, but the intention is to stay open in order to, to provide all the chances we can possibly get. I think closing is going to have more of a negative impact than remaining open in present times. So do come um, if you can. Come and have a cup of tea at the Wallace with a knight of, of armour in the middle of the courtyard. Fantastic. Uh, we had a question from Julia. Would you like to unmute yourself and just ask? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, it was just about um, as an, uh, there was an event that she attended in 2018 with a walk around uh, illustrating the life of Sir Richard Wallace. Um, it was an event of limited numbers and, and one, uh, she asked if there was a possibility if, if something like that could be done again. Yeah, that was when we celebrated Richard Wallace's birthday and uh, we commissioned a, a play about his life. And it was quite wonderful because you would follow the actors around the Wallace and they basically we recreated his life through through the actors. Um, it's a difficult one to to do now with social distancing and and, and actors in in such close proximity. So it's going to be difficult. But we we've been wondering whether we could do a, some kind of recording of it, or um, even a, just a, a sort of podcast where you can just hear it and maybe walk through the rooms and 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 hear it uh, as you walk through. So that's something that we don't want to sort of see be, being forgotten. It's something that was such a success. Only very few people experienced the, um, this, this, this um, reenactment. So we, we, it's something we are, we're keen to, to do. So we're talking to sponsors about possibly you know, finding a way of recording it and get, maybe getting great actors of today who are unemployed <laughs> to do it, which is actually probably a very good idea. That sounds fantastic. Thank you. Um, last chance for questions. Anyone else? 
Okay. Well, oh, um, um, Xavier, thank you so much. This was absolutely fascinating. Um, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed having being back in the museum, but from home. And uh, you really inspired me and I'm sure many of us here too. Um, we will be coming in for a cup of tea and looking at some armor soon, as soon as we can get to you. Um, Xavier has been so generous with his time and support of the bursary's appeal. And he referred to the Henry Moore exhibition last year. He held um, a tour for us in aid of the bursary's appeal um, a couple of years ago as well. So thank you for your ongoing support. Um, thank you to our audience for your questions, for being involved, for being here with us today. Um, if you'd like to join us for more virtually speaking talks, um, we will, th there should be a link in the chat bar and you can see all of those uh, there. We've got some really exciting talks coming up, which you can register for on the link, including um, another um, lecture by Robert Orm, who's with us here today. It'll be his fourth or fifth in the series on magical art. And in a month's time, uh, there's a talk on the search for the COVID vaccine. So we've got something for everyone. Uh, you will see a few other links in the chat as well. Um, there is a donations page uh, and we'd really appreciate your support. Anything you do really um, helps the work that we, that we do here. Uh, you will also see a link for our Inspiring Minds video, which we recently launched to celebrate the halfway point in our uh, fundraising campaign. And, and um, also you will see, um, you can watch any of the previous lectures that we, um, that we have run so far as part of the, this lecture series. Um, sadly, that brings us to the end of the presentation. So thank you so much for joining us, Xavier. Thank you so much for sharing your inspiring story and the work that you do at the Wallace Collection. Thank you very much.